What three things does a producer want in a screenplay? I would say, for, for me personally, I'm a genre producer, uh, I want originality. Uh, if it's not original, I don't want to have seen it for a long time. <laughs> uh, and I want it to be 90 pages. I, I really do feel there are very few movies that are horror movies that need to be longer than 90 minutes, typically. I mean, you'll get The Shining and different things like that, but, but typically, I think that horror movies and comedies should be 90 minutes. Get in, get out, see the funny, see the scary, that's it. That's what I think. What are the top reasons you would reject a screenplay? Um, it's not original, or I've seen it very recently. Um, you know, is it an idea, most of all, is it an idea I think people will want to see? Again, coming back to it, who wants to see this movie, right? Is there an audience for this movie? If I don't think there's an audience for the movie where I think it's a very small audience, then it's more than likely a pass from me. But have you watched a film or read a script where you can tell this wouldn't test well, going back to your marketing brain, mm -hmm. but you personally liked it? I mean, there are some scripts that are, in fact, I read one, it was just, it's an incredible script, it's batshit crazy, it's not a horror movie, but it's just, you know, it's about the depths of alcoholism or something, right? And I just thought this was such a crazy, you know, almost Darren Aronofsky kind of script or whatever, but I, I kept on going back to like, wow, would I want to put money in this movie? Because they wanted some money or whatever. Uh, and I was like, ah, I think I would put money in the movie, but I'd really have to have a very um, big conversation with the other producers and the director as to how we're going to market this film. Because it's very specific, like critic-driven sort of like piece that we'd have to get it into like a Sundance or a Tribeca or like a con or something like that. It's the only way this movie is gonna make its money back, right? And so um, so the answer is yes, I would take a risk on certain things, but you better know how to market that thing. You better know exactly how you're gonna try to get your money back because it's not like the normal way you would with a mainstream audience. How long did you ponder this, this script? Um, I pondered it up right up until production when they were gonna make the movie, and I was about to write a check for the movie. However, I found out sadly there was some uh, bad players involved with the movie, and uh, I'm not going into names or anything like that, but I, uh, I found out there were some people, like, like you should Google everybody. Like, look, I put everyone in IMDb Pro, but sometimes you Google people and you just have to come up with like this person's name, this person ruined my life.com, and you're like, holy shit, how did I overlook this? And then you're just like, I can't be in business with that person. So that's the main reason I didn't do it. I loved the script, I loved everything about it. I loved the director, right? The director's fantastic, but this other guy, mm, didn't want to touch him with a 10-foot pole. How many pages of a screenplay will you read before you move on? I read the whole thing. I mean, it, it might take me six months to read it, but if I say I'm gonna read it and eventually you bug me enough, I will read it and I will give you notes. So that is typically, at least you get that from me. Um, but I'm, I'm you know, I try to read at least a script a day, and I'm really backlogged. So I'm always trying to like catch up, really, in some ways. Where do you find these scripts? Um, you know, it's uh, I have managers that send things to me. I have uh, you know a couple agents that you know feed me stuff. I have a lot of filmmaker friends that we've made at uh, different film festivals or just living in Los Angeles, really. Uh, they're, you know, and then they're successful people in their sort of careers in some way. And so they always like send me stuff and like, well, listen, can you find me some money? Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. Um, sometimes uh, it's something where we need to go to somebody much bigger to, to raise the money because it's like, you know, much bigger budget. But, uh, but I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very into networking and I'm very into, um, you know, surrounding myself with hopefully talented people who are consistently making interesting product and who are consistently making interesting scripts and stories. How did you find the screenplay for 1BR? Um, my uh, ex-wife went to uh, high school with Allard Cantor. Uh, Allard Cantor and Jared Murray are two managers that run a company called Epicenter. And David Marmer, uh, our writer-director, was rep by these guys. 
So I had one of those lunches that you have in Los Angeles where you talk about the projects you're working on and another, you know, douchebaggery. And, uh, you know, uh, at the end of that lunch, I was sent two scripts uh, and I never read for six months. And the reason was, in my own defense, is we were about to go to production on something else and I was very, you know, pre-production and that sort of like pit of hell and I was working very hard on that and that project fell through. And all of a sudden I found myself looking, you know, for scripts and I'm like, oh, let me read these scripts I didn't read before. And I read those, both of those scripts. One of them was a movie called Tragedy Girls, which is a fantastic horror comedy. Um, and uh, Craig Robinson's in it, a bunch of people are in it. Uh, I, I, I basically read that script and I said, no, because horror comedy is tough to do. Invariably you find that the horror audience doesn't think it's scary enough and the comedy audience thinks it's too scary. So I said, that's a pass. And they told me, hey, that we just finished that movie last week. And I said, what do I know? <laughs> the second movie was uh, 1BR. And loved the, loved the, loved the script. I uh, met with David Marmer right away. And, you know, we got along. Uh, he, uh, you know, very smart, sweet, soft-spoken guy, but really, you know, knows what he wants. Um, so I immediately, uh, you know, found a script that way and, uh, you know, called my producing partner and was like, listen, we gotta like, we gotta, you gotta read this. You gotta like, we gotta, we gotta sign a letter of intent to like, you know, to get an operating agreement together and, and start uh, making this our first film. So that's how it started. So you did the Hollywood lunch. You, you did the Hollywood lunch. Uh, you know, I mean, you say what you want about the Hollywood lunch. It's, uh, it's, it's very necessary. I mean, so I'll tell you this though. You go to Sundance and it's like going to 500 meetings without having to drive. That's what I think. But I wonder in some sense, because you know, you're all feeling good, you're around like-minded people, maybe it skews, it, maybe it's better to have the lunch because you're in LA, you're dealing with all the stuff that's true to LA, and it's sort of like dating. You wanna know, is this going to work? With this person, sure. I mean, like, I'm sure that's that's uh, you know. I mean, it's a reason you meet people in general. I mean, I met David Marmer for a coffee, right? right. And you know, we met at the Culver Hotel and hung out, and you know, had a scone. And like, look, <laughs> you, t you talk about your sensibilities. You talk about what you're interested in. You talk about like, is there is there something here? Do we have like, oh well, I really love Exorcist Three. I love Exorcist Three. Like, I mean, do you have the same sensibilities? Um, I think that's that's another reason that you meet with people. But like, look, uh, you know, that lunch or a coffee or a drinks or whatever it is, is it's just connection any which way, right? That's what we're talking about at the end of the day. Are you connected to the person? Could I work with this person? Can I work with this person when the car breaks down? Which invariably it will break down. Like that's the whole idea about making a movie that the car keeps on breaking down. What do you do when the car breaks down? Well, you could yell and scream or you could say, okay, well, what are we gonna do about this now? How are we gonna solve this problem, right? And you want like-minded people. Right, and so sometimes you discover that when you're making a movie, sometimes you discover that before the movie because you just kind of sense this person's a nice person. He's not a yeller. He's gonna talk, and you know, I can be the yeller. You know, whatever it is, like good cop, bad cop, whatever it is, right? Um, but I think what you're trying to get at, I think it's more about connection. Like that's the reason these lunches or whatever, they are drinks or coffees or whatever. You wanna find out that they have the, you're like-minded, you have the same sensibilities, and maybe you have the same goals. And it's not just a year that you may be tied to this person, maybe several years. Oh, yeah. So to know that as well, like this isn't just a one and done one Look, year. And to be fair, I didn't think that. But now I know that. <laughs> like I thought we'd be done. Like, oh, we're shooting this thing as a lark. It's 2017 December. Uh, it'll be out by uh, next year. No, no. And then when it does come out, it comes out during COVID. So now we're, you know, definitely like stuck together and we didn't get everything we thought we would get, you know, in terms of a theatrical release or whatever it is, you know. What was it in the screenplay for 1BR that made you want to make this movie? Um, it just wasn't expected. I mean, you know, the way it sort of read at the beginning, and I didn't know anything about it. I just went in cold, right? Uh, at first you think it may be something supernatural. You may think it's a bunch of different things. A lot of sort of red herrings going on. And then it turns out to be something kind of really different and something we haven't seen in a while. Um, if you know in a, in a long while and then it, it it actually is somewhat original in addition to that the kind of twist and turns like every act there's something that pivots in a different way which i hadn't seen hardly at all if not in a long time um and to be fair like it was on the script level but it became even more in the edit as well but on the script level like it definitely was something much different than we hadn't seen in a long time and it was contained uh, in terms of the actual atmosphere was contained, which is important for a low budget film, uh, you know. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of the unique thing about it. It was in our budget level. 
it definitely was something we hadn't seen before, and it, it, it went places we didn't quite expect, and it pivots at different parts of the, the different acts. It pivots in different ways that it made it very sort of interesting even on the page. And so when you took your, your test marketing, your research brain, how did it measure up? Well, I mean, look, I, I, th I thought about trailer moments, right? And, you know, it's funny, like, uh, it had trailer moments. It had, it had definite trailer moments. I also knew that, look, like the performance that this, this young lady is going to give, Nicole Bryden Bloom gave, is going to be key to the whole thing. Like, she literally is like the movie. Like, the, her face has to emote, and she has to have that kind of face. I mean, Nicole has these big eyes, and she you can just tell there's like a million things going on with her, with her when she like, you know, looks at the camera. Right? We needed to find like that particular actress, and we did, thankfully. We knew the ending was extremely important. Um, you know, we knew there were little, we did little thing, we knew there was little things within the script that we could toggle and, and sort of make our, make our own in terms of like producers giving some, you know, advice and the different things like that. I mean, like the, the, we had a torture song in there, right? That happens in the movie, I'm giving, hopefully giving out too many spoilers. Um, but like, um, you know, we went through a couple different, you know, ideas of this. The producers came up with ideas, and then, you know, David had ideas, and we were able to, like, you know, get the right song and everything else. So that was even sort of on the script level that we sort of noticed the little things we could do that would make the movie maybe successful in some right in terms of, like, or our traditional sense of, of, of successful in terms of, like, maybe a mainstream thing. Did you envision the audience who, who would be watching this? Absolutely. I mean, look, we, we knew that, um, you know... It was such a smart script. We knew that we had almost a almost a, a, a four quadrant audience of sorts. Uh, you know, eight. You know, it was, it's not nobody under eighteen is really about this movie. I don't think, unfortunately. Like it, that's what we at least see from like uh, IMDb and different uh, places that have like um, you know uh, demographics and, and, and different things like this data. Um, we knew that um, it, it, it skew older. Weirdly, it, it was a lot of accessibility to the movie. And in fact, it was, it was confirmed in a way. We, we went into a, for a meeting with Netflix, and Netflix told us, you know why we like your movie? Because this is the kind of movie you can watch with your mom. And we were like, oh, wow. I don't know whether to be insulted or, <laughs> yeah, I guess we're going to take that as a compliment because it's accessible. And we could, we could see that sort of on the script level too, where, okay, it's, it's kind of thoughtful in certain ways. There is like violence to it. But the way the violence is framed was that it was purposeful. It wasn't gratuitous. There's nothing where we're trying to like, you know, there's no, you know, you could go different places with like movies that people get sort of maybe um, put through the ringer, let's call it. But we knew that this didn't have any of that, thankfully. I mean, it has some elements of, of, of horror and different things like this. I mean, really the movie's a psychological thriller with elements of horror, right? That's what we define it as. So we knew that, that it had enough of, um, these different elements to be uh, to make it accessible to a wider audience, even on the page. Well, you also have a strong um, supporting character who's older, and and I think they work well together, the protagonist and that character. And it also shows the goodness of your protagonists in the dealings with this sure. person without giving away too much. But I, I, I like that. I thought that was um, well. A, I mean, a the other component. thing on the page that was interesting is that even the so-called villains in the in the film. Like they think they're doing right. Like they really do believe that they are helping people, and clearly, it's, it's misguided. But you you almost kind of see, like our main character kind of see their point of view, which is interesting in its own right too. Like she kind of sees like, okay, this maybe could be a good life. You know, maybe they, maybe these rules are actually kind of necessary, misguided as they may be. What's your advice to screenwriters who are trying to pitch their scripts and get them read? I think that you. I, coming back to it, hopefully it's original. If it's not original, hopefully it's something you haven't seen in a long time. Or it's done in such a way that it is a new spin on whatever this maybe standard genre thing could be, right? I mean, we have so many different, like, you know, Groundhog's Day movies. Now we have the horror versions of them. Now we have, like, you know, the, the people that will take it and do a different twist. I mean, you know, Freaky Friday. Horror version is freaky, let's say. Well, they kind of did the same twist, but differently, right? They made it their own. Um, so I guess my advice is if you can go original, go original. If you don't, if it's not original, then have a new spin on it so that it seems like it's original. Or you haven't seen it in a long time. Those are the things. The other thing, too, is uh, don't turn in anything that's halfway done. 
You're never going to get a second chance. I'm not going to read it again. I can tell you that. There's very few people that I'd read a, second script, a script a second time for if I didn't like it the first time. So you better, when you're going to give it to somebody, it better be in its finest form. Like have all the typos out of it. Have every, you know, format it correctly. Just make sure you're putting your best foot forward when you're giving it to somebody to read because they are spending their time to read it too, right? You've spent your time to make it, they're spending their time to read it. What about the school of thought that like certain things are in style for a, a short window of time? So found footage after Blair Witch, now there's all this found footage stuff for a while and it's trendy, it's what people want to see. What about going with the flow if you can do it within a short window of time? I mean, look, everyone's trying to make Terrifier 2 now, right? Like Terrifier 2 made a billion dollars, well, I mean, made like $13 million, but it was shot for like $250,000. And now everyone's thinking, look, if I can just put together this ultra gross movie, I can maybe get it on the big screen too. What they don't realize is that Terrifier 2 had like aims eight to 10 years worth of awareness for that film. Uh, was on you know Netflix and all the AVOD platforms. Like the, the, the Terrifier one from two, came out 2016. It's 2022. Six years that movie had of like people soaking it up and some people actually liking the film. So that when it came out, they didn't do any marketing for that film. They just put loose it in 750 theaters. Maybe like a million three, million four opening weekend and went up every weekend, right? It's because it had awareness. That was the main thing. You can't just jump on this bandwagon, let's call it, and hope to like you know make some money. Like they, they tried to do this with uh, uh, the uh, Grinch movie, You're the Mean One or whatever, which is not as good as Terrifier 2, by the way. But, but they tried to be jump on this bandwagon. Oh, this is gonna be ultra gross. And it's like, you know, it's the Grinch and it should be really interesting and didn't make that much money compared to Terrifier 2 because Terrifier 2 is actually good and had a lot of awareness for it. So, but, the, but there's, al look, there's always these things where, okay, the shark movie is popular. Well, you go to Tubi, there's literally 100 shark movies. Oh, clown movies are popular. There is a shark clown movie on Tubi <laughs> right now that I haven't watched, but exists, right? There's a Santa clown shark movie on Tubi right now, right? You can try to take all these genres that you think are popular and make a movie, and maybe you'll make some money. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a trend. Try to do something that people aren't doing, right? Try to do something that, like, you know, you haven't seen, hopefully. And other people will copy you. Here's a funny thing. So um, Netflix rejected us twice before they, they took us the third time. They took us the third time because we did well on VOD. And we opened during COVID, so no one was watching anything. So maybe that helped us too. But we took, took Netflix our VOD, VOD numbers. We said, hey, look, look, we did pretty well. And they're like, all right, we'll take you. We'll give you no money, but we'll take you. So then fast forward to us getting to number one and staying in the top five for like you know eight days. Our friends go in for a meeting with Netflix. And they're like, it's gonna be a pass. We're looking for female in peril, contained atmosphere. Da -da -da. Everything we had gotten rejected for, now they're looking for it, right? Here's the truth of it. You write something original that's interesting and then they'll copy you, right? They don't believe until they believe is the idea. So that's why doing something original maybe is not the worst thing to do. As long as you can market it. That's the main thing. Rising above the noise is the toughest part for most filmmakers, it's, just so, it's so easy to make a movie nowadays. There's hundreds of horror movies. All of them have better post posters than the next. But rising above the noise is the main thing. If you have something original, it's even better.